السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه In the month of Ramadan on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays um, I was asked to do a talk after Asr so um, we started that last weekend and um, I'm going to continue assuming that you guys are interested in me continuing inshallah I apologize if I'm disturbing anyone here uh, but I was asked to do this so hopefully uh, you will not be disturbed <coughs> So last time we uh, were reading from the book The Ta'if Al-Ma'arif by Al-Hafidh ibn Rajab Al-Hanbali Rahimahullah Ta'ala The chapter on the virtues of Ramadan And um, we will continue inshallah He says Rahimahullah Ta'ala وفي الصحيحين عن ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما قال كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس وكان أجود ما يكون في رمضان حين يلقاه جبريل فيدارسه القرآن وكان جبريل يلقاه في كل ليلة من رمضان فيدارسه القرآن فلرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حين يلقاه جبريل أجود بالخير من الريح المرسلة on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, who said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most generous of all people. And he was uh, more generous than at any other time in the month of Ramadan, when he would be met with Jibreel, who would study with him the Qur'an. Jibreel used to meet with him every night during the month of Ramadan and they would uh, review the Qur'an together they would study the Qur'an together and by Allah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whenever he would meet Jibreel he was more generous than the rain clouds that bring torrential rains this hadith is related by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim in their Sahih collections and from this hadith we learn a few things. Ibn Rajab mentions a few things, uh, commenting on this hadith. One thing that we learn is that the Prophet ﷺ was the most generous of all human beings. كَانَ أَجْوَدَ بَنِي آدَمْ عَلَى الْإِطْلَاقِ This is something that is part of our belief actually. That Rasulullah ﷺ was the most generous human being. And so when we see acts of kindness and generosity today at our times when uh, you know, millionaires uh, donate uh, large amounts of money in charity, that should not fool us. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was more generous than any human being. And he was the most virtuous, the most knowledgeable, the most brave, and the most complete and perfect of all human beings. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam And his generosity was not just limited to wealth He was generous in every aspect of that word, generosity uh, He was generous with his knowledge He was generous with his wealth He was generous with his self um, He says, rahimahullah ta'ala Wa kana juduhu bi jami'i anwa'i jud من بذل العلم والمال وبذل نفسه لله تعالى في إظهار دينه وهداية عبادته عباده that he would even uh, sacrifice his own time his own person for the sake of the deen for the sake of bringing guidance to people وإصال النفع إليهم بكل طريق and to bring benefit to people in every possible way من إطعام جائعهم ووعظ جاهلهم وقضاء حوائجهم وتحمل أثقالهم He would feed the hungry He would admonish the ignorant He would fulfill the needs of the needy He would carry their loads and so on and so forth 
ولم يزل صلى الله عليه وسلم على هذه الخصال الحميدة منذ نشأ and Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم was like this since the very beginning even before he became a prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Allah عز وجل raised him that way he did his tarbiya that way ولهذا قالت له خديجة في أول مبعثه and that's why خديجة رضي الله تعالى عنها our mother she said to him when he received the first revelation والله لا يخزيك الله أبدا إنك لا تصل الرحم وتقر الضعيف وتقر الضيف وتحمل الكل وتكسب المعدوم وتعين على نوائب الحق she said to him when the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came to Sayyidah Khadija in a state of worry and in a state of fear when he had first met Jibreel and among the things that he said to her صلى الله عليه وسلم was that uh, that he was afraid that people were going to reject him and because of what he had seen nobody would believe in him and so Sayyidah Khadija consoled him and strengthened him and reassured him and among the things that she said was that Wallahi la yukhzik Allah abada by Allah, Allah will never forsake you Allah will never abandon you Allah will never disgrace you إِنَّكَ لَتَصِلُ الرَّحِمُ You connect the ties of kinship. تُعْتَقْرِ الضَّيْفِ And you are hospitable to the guest. وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلْبِ And you uh, take care of the needy. وَتَكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومِ And you provide for the one who has nothing. وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ And you uh, help to establish truth and and justice. ثم تزايدت هذه الخصال فيه بعد البعثة وتضاعفت أضعافا كثيرة. And afterwards, after Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم became a prophet, these types of qualities only increased with time. So he was like this before he even became a prophet, and these qualities continued to increase after he became a prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. There's another hadith in uh, Bukhari and Muslim in which Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu said كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ أَحْسَنَ النَّاسِ وَأَشْجَعَ النَّاسِ وَأَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ That he صلى الله عليه وسلم was the best of people, the bravest of people and the most generous of people. Okay, so this is something that the companions uh, noticed collectively. And remember that they lived at a time when the Quraysh were known for their generosity as well. You know, the Quraysh would compete in generosity. Right? The famous Hatim al Ta'i. Hatim al Ta'i lived before uh, the time of the Sahaba. His son, uh, Adi ibn Hatim, is one of the Sahaba. Hatim al Ta'i is an icon of generosity from the generation of the Prophet. That's the generation, that's the society in which he was brought up. And yet, he is known among the Sahaba to be the most generous of all people. You know? So, يعني, he is not living at a time when people are stingy. He's living at a time when people are already known for their generosity. Even the Kuffar of Quraysh were known. This is one of their noble attributes that they were known for, for their generosity. And yet, Rasulullah is being described as the most generous of all people. And Fi Sahih Muslim Anhu also, uh, Sahih Muslim narrates on the authority of Anas that he said, مَا سُئِلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ شَيْئًا إِلَّا أَعْطَاهُ فَجَاءَهُ رَجُلٌ فَأَعْطَاهُ غَنَمًا بَيْنَ جَبَلَيْنِ فَرَجَعَ إِلَى قَوْمِهِ فَقَالَ يَا قَوْمْ أَسْلِمُوا فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا يُعْطِي عَطَاءَ مَنْ لَا يَخْشَ الْفَاقَةِ That he said that Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم would never be asked for anything except that he would give it. <coughs> A man once came to him and he asked him for a flock of sheep that were filling a valley between two hills. A large flock of sheep between two hills, filling a valley between two hills. He asked for that entire flock of sheep. And, uh, so, uh, I mean, he, uh, the, he gave him, the Rasulullah gave him that entire flock of sheep. And so the man was so uh, flabbergasted by this generosity, he didn't expect that. He came to ask him for something. He didn't expect such a large amount. I mean, you can imagine a large flock of sheep. How much is a goat nowadays, you know? It's like $300, $400 for a goat. A cheap goat, maybe $300. Back home, maybe, you know, 
you know, $200 for a goat. Imagine an entire flock of sheep. We're talking about how many thousands of dollars? Just like that, you know. So, the man is flabbergasted. He goes back to his people and he says, Ya qawmi aslimu. He says to his people, my people accept Islam. Because Muhammad gives like someone who does not have any fear of poverty. He gives as if he does not fear poverty. You know, he has no fear of poverty. When we are asked to give, we think ten times, a hundred times because we're afraid of what's going to happen next month. Am I, I have these bills to pay. We're afraid, we're worried. But Rasulullah gives as though he does not fear poverty. That's what this man said. وفي رواية لو أن رجلا سأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم غنما بين جبلين فأعطاه إياه فأتقه فقال يا قوم أسلم فإن محمد يعطي عطاء ما يخاف الفقر. Pretty much the same thing in another رواية. Okay. So Anas then also says that people at the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم sometimes would come and accept Islam and the only thing they're interested in is dunya. Because they know that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is generous. So they expect to become wealthy by accepting Islam. So the only motivation that some people had, some people at that time to accept Islam, was they were interested in wealth. They were interest, interested in money. In كَانَ الْوَجُلُ لَيُسْلِمُ مَا يُرِيدُ إِلَّا الدُّنْيَا So people would come and accept Islam, the only thing that they're interested in is dunya. فَمَا يُمْسِي حَتَّى يَكُونَ الْإِسْلَامُ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا عَلَيْهَا But by the time evening comes, Islam is the most beloved thing to that person. It becomes the most beloved thing to that person, more beloved than everything that this dunya has. So people would initially be motivated to accept Islam for worldly purposes, but by the, when they spend some time with the Prophet ﷺ, with the companions in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a few hours later, or a few days later, according to this, even a few hours later, by the evening, Islam is more beloved to them than anything else and it is no longer dunya that keeps them in Islam. They love Islam and they're then willing to give up dunya for the sake of Islam. That same dunya which was their initial aim for accepting Islam. And uh, this, there's a story of uh, Safwan ibn Umayyah that he mentions. Safwan ibn Umayyah uh, was one of the leaders of Quraysh who was very antagonistic to Islam and the Prophet ﷺ for a long time. But then, uh, he accepted Islam. When Safwan accepted Islam, it was at a time when the Prophet ﷺ had won some battles and money was coming in, much more than ever before. So, because of the spoils of war. So, Safwan says, لَقَدْ أَعْطَانِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ مَا أَعْطَانِي وَإِنَّهُ لَمِنْ أَبْغَضِ النَّاسِ إِلَيْهِ فَمَا بَرِحَ يُعْطِينِي حَتَّى إِنَّهُ لَأَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَيْهِ He said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, started to give me from the spoils of war. And Safwan said that I, I didn't used to like him. He was the most hated person to me in the world. Because, you know, he had been fighting with him for so long, all the things that happened in Mecca and in Medina, right? So he was the most hated of all people to me. But he continued to give me and give me and give me until he became the most beloved of all people to me. You know, when, when you hate someone and they know that you hate them, you see, Allah Rasulullah knew Safwan's feelings towards him. When someone hates you, I mean, when, when, when someone hates you, and you know that they hate you, and yet you give them, and you give them, and you give them, naturally, that person, their heart will change. You know, why do I hate this person so much? They're so generous to me. They keep being kind to me, and generous to me, and nice to me. Why do I hate them? It will change the heart of the person. So that's what happened with Safwan. Despite his hatred for Rasulullah وسلم, he continued to give him until his heart changed. And he says, then he became the most beloved of all people to me. 
Ibn Shihab said, أَعْطَاهُ يَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ مِئَةً مِنَ الْغَنَى النَّعَمِ ثُمَّ مِئَةً ثُمَّ مِئَةً وفي مغازل الواقدي أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أعطى صفوان بن أمية يومئذ واديا مملوءا إبلا ونعما فقال صفوان أشهد ما طابت بهذا إلا نفس نبي ابن شهاب says that on the day of Hunayn when the Muslims won the battle of Hunayn after which they uh, acquired a lot of wealth after the battle of Hunayn after the battle of Hunayn Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave to Safwan 100 um, camels 100 camels and then he gave him another 100 and then he gave him another 100 and in the Maghazi of Al-Waqidi one of the famous early books of Sira Al-Waqidi says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave Safwan ibn Umayyah on that day a valley full of uh, uh, camels and sheep. And at that point, Safwan, when he received that from Rasulullah he said, I testify that no one can do this except a prophet. No one can do this willingly. No one can show this kind of generosity willingly, voluntarily, except a prophet. So at that point, he became convinced that he was a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So generosity is a tremendous virtue. And that's why brothers and sisters, sometimes you see us encouraging you to show generosity to all kinds of causes in our area. When we show generosity to our surrounding community, it has an effect. People attach that to Islam and that can go a long way. From the very beginning, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself was generous to the kuffar in addition to the believers, to the kuffar and he encouraged the Muslims to be generous to the kuffar one of the first surahs that was revealed to the believers was what? وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا تَجَى مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرُ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَى وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى then what does it say? فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرُ وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرُ Do not turn away فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرُ Do not be rude to the, to the orphan and do not turn away the beggar. Which beggar is Allah Azza wa Jal talking about? At that time there are no believers except for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Khadija and Ali and Abu Bakr and Zayd. That's it, just five. Those are the only believers. And Allah Azza wa is telling the Prophet Sallallahu do not turn away the beggar. Which beggar? Has to be a non-Muslim beggar. You know? So if from very early on, Islam came and did not distinguish between Muslim and non-Muslim when it comes to helping the needy and the poor. And therefore it is very important for us to participate in charitable causes in our own community. In our own community, we should not only send money overseas to help our brothers and sisters in need over there, but we should also become agents of uh, providing help and support in our own community, in the larger community. And we do that for the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal and out of genuine care for our people, because these are our people, it's our country. We do that out of genuine care for our people. And maybe Allah Azza wa Jal will use that as a means to turn the hearts of people towards Islam. And we will be rewarded as, as a result of that. It is famous about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah. مَا سُئِلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ شَيْئًا قَطْ فَقَالَ لَا this is one of the shama'il, one of the qualities of the Prophet ﷺ, that he was never asked about anything and he said no. He, never asked for, he was never asked for anything and he said no. In fact, some of the poets, one of the poets said that if it was not for la ilaha illallah, he would have never said la. If it wasn't for la ilaha illallah, he would have never said la. No, no God but Allah. 
it's a type of mubalagha, uh, it's a type of hyperbole to basically, it's a metaphor to, to point out how generous the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was. Once um, someone, he mentions a story, it's related by Bukhari in Hadith Sahal ibn Sa'ad, that uh, someone came and they gifted a, a garment to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa an outfit. Somebody gave him a gift, an outfit. So the Prophet ﷺ took that from that person and he put it on because he actually needed an outfit. He needed an outfit. So he put it on. While he was outside in this new outfit that was just gifted to him and he's wearing it for the first time and he needs that outfit. He doesn't have a new outfit. A man, a sahabi came to him and he asked him for it. Ya Rasulullah, would you please give it to me? So the Prophet ﷺ immediately went home, took it off, gave it to him. It's for you. And Rasulullah ﷺ went away, walked away. When the Prophet ﷺ walked away, other sahaba who saw that, they came to this man. And they said to him, Woe oh, to you. Why did you do that? كَانَ مُحْتَاجًا إِلَيْهَا وَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ أَنَّهُ لَا يَرُدَّ they said to him that you know that he needed that and you know that he does not say no. Why did you do that then? So the man said, Qala innama sa'altuha litakuna kafani. He said that I asked for it because I wanted it to be my shroud, my kafan. I want to be buried in it. Because he saw that Rasulullah has worn it. And now he wants to be shrouded in something that was worn by the Prophet and nobody else has ever worn it except him. He wanted the barakah of that. You see, there's nothing wrong in seeking barakah from the body of Rasulullah. The Sahaba used to do that all the time from his hair, from his sweat, from his clothes from the places he walked on, from the places he stood on, from the places he sat on, from the places he prayed on, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, this sahabi, that's what he wanted. He wanted that outfit to be shrouded in. Because why? Why, why, why does he want to be shrouded in that? Because he's hoping that he will be protected from the fire and protected from the punishment of the grave if he is covered in a clothing that, was, that touched the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the point of mentioning the story here is to show the generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Kana yu'siru ala nafsihi wa ahlihi wa awladihi. He used to choose others over his own family. He used to prefer others over his own wife and his own children and his own self. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said about him that كان يأتي عليه الشهر والشهران لا يوقد في بيته النار that a month or two months would pass by and no fire would be lit in the home what does that mean? that means that no meat is served in the home for two months at a time no fire is lit nothing that can be that has to be cooked is eaten in his home he eats date he eats water he eats Maybe bread, I don't know. But nothing that needs to be cooked on fire. No fire is lit in his home for a month, two months at a time. وَرُبَّمَا رَبَطَ عَلَى بَطْنِهِ الْحَجَرَ مِنَ الْجُوعِ And sometimes you would find him walking with a rock tied around his tummy because to, uh, to subdue the pangs of hunger. To subdue the pangs of hunger. Because when you press the stomach, it, it, it subdues the feeling of hunger by shrinking it. So it to keep the rock tied to his tongue. And not because he does not have. He has, but he gives it up. You see, it's not that he doesn't have wealth, he has no choice. No, he has money. He gets money, but he gives it away. So this is by choice, not by force. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kana qad atahu Fashakat ilayhi fatimatu ma talqa min khidmati al-bayt. Wa talabat minhu khadiman yakfiha 
مؤنة بيتها فأمرها أن تستعين بالتسبيح والتكبير والتحميد عند نومها وقال لا أعطيك وأدع أهل الصفة تطوى بطونهم من الجوع famous story that's mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and Muslim Imam Ahmad many books of hadith in which once his beloved daughter Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha came to him because <clears throat> Fatima and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhuma they used to have a very simple life Ali used to go out and work and Fatima used to take care of the home. Ali would go out and he would draw water from a well. Okay? Draw water from the well. Uh, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha at home she would grind and, and uh, knead the dough, make bread, all with her own hands. And there came a time when uh, Ali came home one day and he said that my, my chest is hurting because of pulling, pulling so much water. And Fatima showed him her hands and they're all rough, roughed up. She said, my hands have become rough and cracked because of the work that I'm doing at home. So... A battle had just ended. A lot of spoils have war, of war had come in. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had acquired some slaves, some servants from that battle. So someone said to Ali that why don't you guys go and ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to give you a slave. Because you see, when uh, at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah azza wa jal revealed ayat in Surah Al-Anfal saying how to divide up the spoils of war. And the direction, the instruction from Allah azza wa jal was that a portion of that has to go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A portion is distributed among the fighters, a portion is given to the weak and the poor and the needy, and a portion goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is. So this, these slaves that are being talked about here, they are his. Uh, the share of the poor and the needy and the, 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 the fighters have already been distributed. Now this is his. And this is his daughter. Fatima is his daughter. Okay? So it makes perfect sense for someone to suggest, go to your father. He has acquired some servants. Ask him for a servant. So Ali says to Fatima, you go. Fatima goes to visit the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's not home. She goes to the masjid. She sees him busy with people, and she feels shy to interrupt him. So she comes back to his home and talks to Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu taala anha, and she tells her, please, when he comes, can you mention to him that you know this is what I came for? And she showed her her hands and so on. So when the Prophet ﷺ came home and he found out, he went to the home of Fatima and Ali ta'ala anhuma, at night. And he came to their door and uh, sought permission to enter. And uh, <clears throat> uh, when he sought permission, he began to hear that some, some sound as if somebody is getting up from bed. Uh, so they told him enter and he, then he heard some noise as if people are getting up from bed so he entered and he said stay where you are stay where you are don't, don't move just stay he doesn't want to disturb them so he comes all the way and there Ali and Fatima are laying down in bed and they have a sheet over them and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that we had only one sheet Think about how many comforters and sheets we have. That only one sheet. And he said the sheet was such that if we put it one way, it would not cover our heads and feet. And if we turned it and put it the other way to make it cover our feet and our heads, it wouldn't cover both of us. So the sheet is too small to cover both people entirely. If they put it laterally, it uncovers their heads and their feet. 
if they put it the other way, it doesn't cover both of them. It doesn't cover their sides. This is the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fatima, the leader of women in Jannah. This is how she lived. So they're laying and they're wearing that sheet laterally. They say, he says they're wearing it laterally. So their feet are uncovered and their heads are uncovered. And so when Rasulullah comes, he sits down right between them. And Fatima, out of shyness, she puts her, tries to put her head under the sheet. And then he starts talking to them. And he says that I heard that you wanted me to give you a servant. Do you want a servant or do you want something better than that? So Ali whispered to Fatima and said, tell him you want something better than that. Don't say servant. Say, I want something better than that. <coughs> so she said, I want something better than that. So the Prophet ﷺ said, every night when you go to bed, say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, before you sleep. 33 times, 33 times, 34 times. Another riwayah says 33, 33, 33, and then La ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lahu al mulku wa shayin qadim. Say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar before you go to sleep. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I la utik wa ada'u ahla sufati tutwa butunahum min al jua. He said that the servants that you heard about, that I had, I am going, I am selling those so that I can take that money and give it to the Ahl Sufa, the people of Sufa. And I cannot give you and leave the people of Sufa who go to sleep hungry at night. The people of Sufa were people who didn't have homes, who used to live in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, and they had devoted themselves to learning from the Prophet ﷺ. Every night, he would sit with them and teach them. After the Sahaba would go home and sleep. And during the day also, Ahl al-Sufa, they didn't have work to do, so they would stay there and learn and review and memorize the Qur'an. So they were students of ilm. And the Prophet ﷺ would prefer them over his own family, his own daughter, radiallahu ta'ala anha. So he taught her and Sayyidina Ali that, you know, instead of me giving you something of this world, let me give you something of the hereafter. Because that is better for you. Every subhanallah uh, grows a tree in, in Jannah for you. So he told them to say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar, every night before they go to sleep. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anha says, years later, Years later, 30, 35, 40 years later, when he is Khalifa, he made a remark to the one to whom he told this hadith. He was sharing this whole story with, with one of the tabi'een, uh, one of the people who had not met the Prophet He shared the story to them. So one of the men that was with him, who was... Um, uh, who used to annoy Sayyidina Ali with too many questions, unnecessary questions. Okay? He asked the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, he asked Sayyidina Ali, I'm sorry, he asked Sayyidina Ali, uh, no wait, before that, Sayyidina Ali said, before that, Sayyidina Ali said that I never spent a night in which I did not say that dhikr. Since that night, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught me that dhikr, since that night, there hasn't been a single night in these 40 years, I don't know, 35, 40 years, in which I have gone to bed without saying that dhikr. That's consistency. Consistency. You know, how many times do we pray and then after the prayer we get up and leave and we don't do our dhikr? Or how many times we go to sleep and we don't do the dhikr? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't do, sometimes we skip a few days. Consistently, every night, for decades. You know, this is, what, this is the type of stuff that these, made these people special. Radiallahu ta'ala. So this man who is with him, this, this annoying person, he says to him, 
every night? You really mean every night? Even the night of Safin? Even the night of Safin? What Safin? Who knows? Which battle is that? Between who? Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. This battle that was fought between two camps of believers. The camp of Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was the governor of Sham and Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was the Khalifa of the time. There was a very unfortunate series of events that happened at the time of Ali. Most of you know about that. One of the most unfortunate events that happened at the time of the Sahaba in, in general and at the time of Sayyidina Ali in particular was the battle of Siffin the battle of Jamal and the battle of Siffin the battle of Jamal was between Sayyidina Ali and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and the battle of Siffin was between Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhuma so it was a very painful few days you know, when, when the believers were fighting one another. Sahaba on both sides. Companions of the Prophet ﷺ on both sides. People who had fought side by side against the Quraysh, against the Romans, against the Persians. Side by side all these years and conquered all these lands. Now they are on opposing sides fighting each other. To kill each other. So the very tense few days. So this man is asking even on the night of Safin, because on one of those nights the battle even took place at night. Okay? And the following day finally they had raised the Musahib, the, uh, the, the camp of the Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala. So even on that night, Ali, even on that night, you said this dhikr? So Sayyidina Ali said to him, Woe to you, why do you ask these kinds of questions? Yes, even on that night. You want to hear it? Yes, even on that night. But I couldn't say it until Sahar time that night. Until Sahar time, right before Fajr. Which basically means he didn't sleep the whole night. The whole night he didn't sleep. Because of being busy with the battle and so on. But before Fajr he made sure that he says the dhikr. That's how seriously they took the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. When he says to them, say this every night before you go to sleep, every night means every night. Every night. رضي الله تعالى عنه وارضاه May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us, help us follow in the footsteps of these giants, of the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah Azza wa Jal inspire us and help us to to be among those who uh, follow the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ with love. May Allah Azza wa make it easy for us to do that. May Allah Azza wa make us among those who remember Allah Azza wa day and night, walking, sitting down and reclining. May Allah Azza wa Jal uh, make us among those who are generous in this month of Ramadan and outside of the month of Ramadan. I'm going to stop here, inshallah ta'ala, there's more, but because of time, I'm going to stop here. Uh, but one thing I would like to say is that, as the hadith mentions, and we will read more tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ was more generous in the month of Ramadan than at any other time. In the month of Ramadan, like the rain clouds that bring torrential rain. And Ibn Rajab is going to mention why that was. Why in particular in Ramadan? Uh, in fact, let me just mention that and then we'll close. Just five more minutes inshallah ta'ala. He says that the reason why, especially in the month of Ramadan, was because, number one, because of the honor of this month, because this is a noble month like we talked about before as well, that the re rewards are multiplied in this month. So when you give charity in this month, the reward is multiplied compared to outside of this month. But the other reason he also mentions is that because uh, we might be fasting and we might be doing things that leave a defect in our fast. There might be deficiencies in our fasting and to make up for that deficiency we give charity. 
in the month of Ramadan to make up for whatever deficiency there is in our fasting. Just like we perform our salah and we pray sunnah afterwards and before to make up for the deficiency in our fard prayer. So similar to that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do this nafil act of charity in the month of Ramadan to teach us to do that so that it can make up for any deficiency in the fard fasting that we're doing in the month of Ramadan. How many times do we lose our temper when we're fasting? How many times do we say things that we shouldn't be saying? We may backbite, we may gossip, we may engage in idle talk, we may see things we're not supposed to see, we may hear things we're not supposed to hear. All of that leaves defects in our fasting. To make up for those defects, he encouraged us sallallahu alayhi wa especially to be more generous in the month of Ramadan. Uh, and ultimately culminating with the zakat al-fitr at the end of Ramadan which is then obligatory to do also with this spirit that to make up for any deficiencies that were in our worship of the month of Ramadan so this is the month of Ramadan we are encouraged to be generous in this month you know that we are raising funds for operations of the masjid so please uh, try your best to participate to take a pledge form it's in the lobby and uh, donate whatever you can for the operations of the masjid in this month may Allah make it easy for all of us to do that you can do that using a pledge form you can use the kiosks you can put money in the donation box but we have three donation boxes one is labeled zakat one is labeled sadaqah one is labeled donation the masjid operations do not run on money from zakah or sadaqah. Okay? Money from zakah and sadaqah are not used by this masjid for operations. Other masajid may do that. There are fatawa that allow for that. There are other fatawa that do not allow for that. In our masjid here, the brothers have made a decision. They do not use that money. Even when we are short on operations uh, um, uh, funds. So, please put your money in the one that says donation. That's the one that's going to go towards the operations of the masjid. Insha'Allah ta'ala. Jazakumullahu khayran. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wa sallillahumma wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa